New York State Fair, or importantly, welcome to the State Police Underwater Recovery Team demonstration. Now, who here is excited to see the best underwater show here at the fair? Yeah! All right, and we are excited to show you. But first, let me introduce you to the rest of my crew coming up behind that tank. First time, every time, Tech Sergeant Josh Cross. My training coordinator out of headquarters. Next up is the Seneca Lake Sea Cow, the Troop E, <laughs> Senior Diver, Tech Sergeant Don Will. Look at attention photo. Uh, we'll explain that a little bit later. Lastly, is your very own Smooth G, the Troop D, Senior Diver, Tech Sergeant Greg Eberall. Now let me introduce you to the host of your show, Everything is Gonna Be Okay, Tech Sergeant Seth Little. All right, hello New York! Before I go, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce Chief Technical Sergeant Neil Case, otherwise known as OTSR Tank. And we have a special guest here today. We got the Special Operations Commander over here, Major Zama. Thanks for coming out, boss. True OT of our tank. Now, while these guys are getting ready to get into the tank here, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson of the New York State Police Dive Team. In 1932, we logged our first dive. That makes us the oldest. And we are also the largest public safety dive team in all the United States, New York State Police. Yeah! Now, back then we had hard helmets, we had canvas suit, lead belt, lead shoes, all together the weight of that equipment was well over 100 pounds. What troopers did then, what troopers continue to do today, they're given equipment, they use that equipment, and they get the job done, no complaining. Well, maybe a little bit. Anyhow, all that being said, in 1943, there was a smart fellow by the name of Jacques Cousteau. He invented the Aqualung. It's what we commonly refer to as SCUBA, Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. It's an acronym, all right? It took the hundreds of pounds of equipment, condensed it down to about 40 pounds, made divers a lot more maneuverable in the water, able to get the job done a little bit easier. At the speed of government, in 1957, the New York State Police decided to adopt SCUBA as its preferred method of dive, and they wanted to learn from the best, so what did they do? Troopers, representatives from the troops went down to learn from the best Navy. They went to the Navy Dive School. They graduated from the Navy Dive School in New Jersey. They brought their lessons back to Albany. And now we have our very own Novice Dive School, don't we, boss? Yes, we do. We've developed a 10-week dive school. We have 18 scuba instructors on staff, and they are all troopers. And we train our new divers from non-diver all the way up through advanced open water. All right, and it is anything but a novice dive school. Trooper position is very competitive, all right? You gotta have the juices flowing. But in order to get where these guys are, we take the best of the best. Two thirds of those that try out for our team will not make it through. Those guys did up there, let's give them a hand. Hey Seth, yep. beautiful day here at the fair. It is. Sun's out. Sun's out. All right, what do you say we get these guys in the water? I think that's a good idea. All right, but before we do kids, if you want to come over here and sit in front of the tank, get a worm's eye view of the divers as they go in the water, come on over. Don't need to ask for permission. Come on over. Stand in front of the tank sit, well, sit down in front of the tank, okay? There's only one rule, no crying. If you get wet, no crying, okay? All right, guys, we're going to give them a dive show, not just any old dive show, New York State Police dive show. All right, that being said, we're not going to enter the water like normal people do. We're going to go in there full speed. You're going to take your gear off and put it in the water first, and we're going to have ourselves a little race. Yes, yes we are. So go ahead, take your gear off, put it in that water. Now, Seth, while they're getting their gear in the water, why would we do this? Why would we train for this? Well, besides races, one of the reasons that we would do this is because a lot of the water that we dive in doesn't look like that tank water. It looks like what's in this bin right here, okay? And so when you dive in water like that, you can become lodged. You can become stuck. We want to make sure that divers do not panic. Panic is the number one thing that will either hurt or kill a diver. You need to be able to take your gear off and put your gear on while you're underwater blindfold. These guys have before they graduate. Hey, guys, masks too. Come on. Uh, Come on. to cheat. Yep, yep, masks in the water. All right, there we go. Now listen, it's a competitive position. 
So without saying it's a race, it's a race, and I want to know by the uh, by your response who you think is going to win. On my left, we have Technical Sergeant Josh Cross. He is first time every time. And on my right, Technical Sergeant Don Will, the elusive Seneca Lake Seacow. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he is all set. Hey, okay. uh, before they get in there. Yeah. Interesting fact about Donnie Will. Yeah. He has not one, but two sets of twins. Whoa! Alright. <laughs> Be riled. Okay. So, when I say go, we're going to count down. Give him a little energy. We're going to go three, two, one, dive. Are you ready to see divers in the water? Yeah. Alright, here we go. Go! Three! Two, wait, 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 one, stop, stop. One, one, one. Today we definitely have at least a thousand oh, people. Oh yeah, there. at least, come on. Right, and we need to sound like we're a thousand people. That's right. Okay, for the podcast. That's for right. the podcast. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Three, two, one. one. In the water. And there they go. The first thing you notice is they will go to their gear. They will put that breathing regulator in their mouth. They have air. Everything else will take care of itself after they have air, all right? They're gonna just try and put on their gear as smooth as possible. They're gonna be racing with each other here. Let's see here, I see uh, Josh Cross has a, oh, Josh Cross is saying he's got, wait, Josh, Josh. You didn't have your strap on your, uh, your yeah. mask there, your strap. Nope. that is a no, that is a no, the Seneca Lake Sea Cow. <laughs> Hey Josh, you're still first time every time. You're the first loser. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, all right. Anyhow, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about their equipment. They have a tank that's on their back. That tank holds high pressure air. And when I say air, I mean air. It's not just oxygen, it's 79% nitrogen. All right, and so they're going to breathe out of that air. In order to do that, they need to reduce it to low pressure. They need to regulate it. There's a regulator that's on top of their tank. That regulator reduces the pressure, sends it down a hose, which then sends it to their breathing regulator, which gives them air on demand at ambient pressures. That tank is also attached to a BC device, a buoyancy control device that allows them to go vertical in the water column. All right, if you add a little air to that BCD, you'll go up, be positively buoyant, take air out, you'll be negatively buoyant, you'll go down. Right now, they're showing you neutral buoyancy. Looks easy, it's not. Okay, in order to be able to come neutrally buoyant and be proficient at it, it takes a lot of years, but what it does do is it allows their fins to do the work. All right, and so it saves them energy, saves them air as they go about their business. Now, that mask that Josh did not fully put on, but he tried fooling us like he did. Take that mask off, take the mask off, all right? So they're going to take that mask off, they're going to reintroduce water into that mask, and they're going to show you how they get that water out. You're just going to reseal the mask, they're then going to put two fingers on top of their mask, they're going to blow air out of their nose. Hopefully they didn't have any milk or anything. And so as they blow the air out of their nose, that air will fill up the mask, it will displace the water, it will push it right out. Then they'll be able to get right about their business and do what they got to do. Our school, even though it's called novice schools, anything but novice, like I said, we dive to depths of 132 feet. And you might ask me what 132 feet looks like. What does it look like? All right, very good. The camera didn't see me doing it. All right, so if you look at the top of this tower up here, this is 60 feet tall. That's what the big bad sword guys jump off of. You add another tower on top of that, 12 more feet. That is 132 feet, all right? Things can happen at those depths. But the number one rule of a diver is what? Don't panic, okay? And actually, Don Will in there, the reason we call him the sea cow is because he can do lengths underwater holding his breath up to 200 feet and beyond. All right, so that is a man who does not panic underwater. 225, I think, something like that, right? Okay, so, but well, let's say you're down at a depth of 132 feet and something goes wrong. Well, don't panic, but also you always dive with a dive buddy. And Josh Cross here is going to say, you're my heart, man. And he's going to say, hey, I'm out of air. I need some help. Don goes over, he takes his primary regulator, and he puts it in his buddy's mouth, and then he goes to a safety second. They both have air. They're sharing. This is called sharing air. And they're making sure that they're OK. And then they're going to go up to the top at a nice leisurely pace of 30 feet per minute. That allows for things to get back in place as they go up and pressures to decrease. We want to avoid decompression sickness, which is what? 
The bends, that's right. The bends, that is the diver's mortal enemy. And so that's what that does as they go up. Our bread and butter, we are the underwater recovery team. All right, searching. Our motto is, if it's in there, we're gonna find it. And boss, if it's not in there, well, we don't if, find if, it. Yeah, we don't find if it. We don't find so if it. we don't find it, then it was obviously never then it there. It was obviously never there. Yeah. Let me step back from that. <laughs> All right. And the reason that we're a search and recovery team is because we're a police diving team. So every scene that we go to, it is a crime scene. Just like in the exhibit over there. If you've seen the crime scene set up above ground, underwater, you'll see these pictures over here. We take measurements. All right. We set up lines. And, uh, and a little known fact, okay, is that fingerprints will actually last underwater. Only up to about 90 days or so, all right, but they will actually last. And there is DNA evidence that can last underwater. And so we want to get in there as soon as possible and get the job done. Now, our, uh, our mascot is the octopus. And how we get the job done is we make sure that we search every part of where we're at, and if you look at that octopus move, it's touching everything as it moves along the floor of the ocean, all right? So as we move along the floor of a riverbed or wherever we happen to be diving, we want to move like the octopus. We get into all the cracks, all the crevices. We make sure that we do a great grid search, all right? So line searches are our go-to as divers, and we're going to give you a demonstration here of what a line search looks like. And I'm going to need a volunteer from over here. Right there, come on. All right, what's your name? Liam, come on over here. Liam, what adult do you belong to? All right, bring that adult out over, one of them. <laughs> She's so glad you raised me to be outgoing. All right. All right, sir, and your name is? Ian, Ian and Liam. All right, very good, come here, Ian. Ian's a diver, all right? And so Ian's been doing some dock work under the water, and, uh, and all of a sudden somebody notices we don't see his bubbles anymore. Okay, and so we want to bring, bring a police team in here and want to make sure that Ian is okay. And so Liam, Liam, you are my land-based specialist, all right? You're a rock right there, you got it? All right, and we're gonna find Ian. And so what happens is, as a diver, I'm in the water, Liam's on top, and we can communicate with each other by this line, all right? And so you're gonna give me a couple tugs. Go ahead, give me a couple tugs. All right, he gives me a couple tugs, I give him a couple tugs back. He knows I'm ready to go now, all right? And so I'm diving. This is called a pendulum search because there's a point right there, and then I'm going back and forth just like a clock pendulum, all right? And so here I reach an area where I can't dive anymore. Liam gives me a couple tugs. I feel that, I know it's time to turn around. I give him a couple tugs back. He releases some rope for me, and here I come, and it's hard to miss. Here he is, Ian. All right, give Liam a hand, good job. And so that is one type of line search we might do in order to affect a rescue of a lost diver, okay? Now there are other line searches that we do in order to find smaller things, like guns or knives, something like that. We have called a jack stay search. And what that is, is it's two heavy weights that are connected by a line. You take those weights, you spread them apart, create a lot of tension on that line, and then the diver will hold on to the line, and then as he swims along or dives along, he touches everything just like what we saw the octopus doing on the riverbed or wherever he might be. Because most of the time when we're doing this, we are in water that looks like this. It doesn't look like that, all right? So Josh Cross is gonna give us a demonstration of a jack stand. Hey, Greg, evidence. You got anything up there that we can use? Oh, service revolver, all right, old school. You know, he, has, he, he has been a trooper for 32, 32 years. 32 years, that's right. <laughs> All right, so Josh is going to commence his dive there. He took his mask and he turned it around. Because of the novice school, we do this with eyes shut, basically. All right, we cover the mask up so they can't see, so that we know that they are doing the job. They're searching every area and they will not panic. And so he gets to the weight, he moves the weight over, and then he is going to turn around. And once he turns around, he's searching as he's doing that, making sure there's nothing in his grabbable area. And he's moving back, and he's going back. And this might seem tedious, but this is the way to get the job done. And he found it. Give him a hand. Josh, take a break. Give yourself a little snack or something. What do you got in there? Oh, he's got a banana. All right, potassium. 
Stay away from those cramps. All right, and again, this seems tedious, but the fact is, is a year ago, we searched up to six acres of water with that technique right there, all right? It takes a lot of mental fortitude in order to be able to keep at task. So, yeah, hey, Seth, what would we use if, uh, if we were looking for something real small, like a uh, uh, bullet casing or something? Well, as I look at my list of useful tools up there, all right, we got uh, diver propulsion vehicles, no, sonar, no, ROV, no. I know what we would use, we'd use a metal detector. So if we're looking for something small, might be in the muck because there's a lot of silt at the bottom of these river beds or lakes, we would use a metal detector. And so I'm gonna need another volunteer. All right, go ahead. And your name is Alexis. All right, Alexis, this is a metal detector here. You ever used one before? No? Okay, it's real easy. Well, first we're going to put a uh, scuba glove on you there. All right, so with your other hand, here's your other hand. Right here. okay. So what is that detecting right now? That is detecting 30 years of marriage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so Alexis, you're going to go back and forth over the water here with your metal detector. You can put it right down there in the water. And then when you get a signal, oh, reach in there with your scuba glove because that's nastiness in there. Oh, what's that? It is a cell phone, all right? And maybe something we should all have the kids go back to flip phones. <laughs> Just saying. All right. Very good. Give her a hand. That's how we would find spent rounds, casings, knives, things like that. All right, very important. Now we had Josh Cross. He, uh, he brought over a, a demonstration four-wheeler for us, but what we're demonstrating right now is someone stole a four-wheeler, they put it in our tank. All right, now there's fingerprints on there, there's DNA on there, we need to get in there real quick. But because the four-wheeler's in there, we're not sure what kind of chemicals are in there. What could we put in there, boss? Well, we've got a robot. Hey, we got a robot, right? Robots don't have feelings yet, fantastic. And so what we would do is if we didn't know what chemicals were in the water, we'd put a robot in there first before we put a diver in there. Or if there was an ice environment that was overhead, we would put a robot in there before we put a diver in there. Why not risk a robot as opposed to a diver? But with this robot, we have HD camera, all right? And we have sonar. We have all these sorts of abilities for it to go throughout the water. I'm just there. Kids, wave to the camera there. Wave to the robot. All right. You see him up there? Very, very exciting. All right, boss. Now you need to uh, be mission-oriented here, task-oriented. What are you doing? You are finding the robot. It's got a little grabber arm on there. All right, if the grabber arm can't grab a hold of something, it will use its thrusters in order to stay in place. And that, we have the most useful tool of all. We have a diver, all right? Robots do not take the place of divers. And so up there, I told you before, we went away from the hard helmet. Well. In these last couple of years, we've gone back to hard helmets. The reason is because as we lift things, we want to protect Craig's beautiful head. All right, we don't want it to get damaged or going in an overhead environment. We give him as much air as he needs and we can hear him breathing. We have communications, make sure he's not nervous. All right, he doesn't sound nervous. He sounds like Darth Vader. You okay, Greg? All right, he says he's good, I'll believe him. So Greg, when you're ready, get in that water. All right, there he goes. Superhero landing and all. Let's give Greg a hand. Good job, Greg. You never looked so good. All right, all right, Greg. Greg, you've got to follow that robot line to where the stolen four-wheeler is and retrieve that four-wheeler for us, okay? So that way they can get to the canine show. Right. <laughs> All right, so he goes over there. He gives himself a little uh, selfie there for his uh, Facebook page. So, Greg, how are you going to get that four-wheeler out of the water? He's going to use science, is what he said. Science! He's going to use Archimedes' principle, buoyancy. And so he has a lift bag. These lift bags come in various sizes, anywhere from 50 pounds up to 5,000 pounds. And you can attach them, all right, to, uh, to these vehicles, just depending on how many you need. But the one thing he does need in that lift bag is he needs air. Top side, sending bubbles. He's sending bubbles, all right. Greg's looking for his hose. 
Greg found his hose. Now Greg's going to stick his hold throughout that old lift bag. Get it up there and expand the bag. You'll see the bubbles will expand that bag. There it goes. Good job, Greg. First time, every time. <laughs> All right, so as you see that bag expanding, the vehicle goes up, diver gets out of the way, because if something happens, what goes up must go down. And so he gets out of the way. Look at him! Look at the hang time on that bear! It's amazing! All right, oh, very good. Very good, very good. All right, let's give him a hand. Good job, Greg. Oh, wow, hey, that's a nice mug you have there, boss. Well, you know, every supervisor should have a good coffee mug. All right, and if you want to drink coffee like the boss, those mugs are for sale. They're for sale right over there at the Trooper Foundation, along with that wonderful shirt that he has on. They help support us. We would appreciate it if you help support them. All right? And so other than that, if you want to drink like a boss and have URT on your cup, that's it right there. All right, one last thing here. Uh, I just want to take a moment to recognize these guys for what they do. Every single time that they go underwater, whether it's for training or recover a victim or to recover evidence, they're putting their lives on the line. So if you could, please all join me and thank them for what they do every day. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Hey, we have the best poser in the New York State Police in that tank right there. Look at him. Six million dollar man. So come on over, take pictures with him. Have your kids take pictures in front of him. It's a memory worth saving. Other than that, those canine, uh, cuddly little dogs will be up next. Have a great day at the New York State Fair. Thank you very much.